joining me. Today I'm going to talk about the tides and the currents in San Francisco Bay and how to make sense of all those eyes glazing over numbers in the tide book. I'm also going to talk about some of the nuances of swimming in aquatic cove. But first, I've got a question for you. What's the difference between a current and a tide? Okay, if you answered that the current measures the speed of the water and that the tide measures the height of the water, you nailed it. But today I'm going to focus primarily on currents. You really only need to know about tides if you want to know whether there's enough water to go through Farnsworth Gap or whether the water's uh, deep enough to jump off a pier without getting stuck in the bottom. And here's one of the very first nuances about swimming in the cove. At Farnsworth Gap, which is located beneath the entrance to Muni Pier, there's a metal loop that hangs down to the water. If the water level is above the bottom curve of the loop, then there's enough water to make your way through safely. If the bottom of the loop is above the water, don't attempt to go through unless you've got a lot of hydrogen peroxide and neosporin back in your, in your locker. And don't ever attempt to go through Farnsworth Gap by yourself on your very first time. Okay, back to the currents. The most fundamental thing you need to know is the current is either ebbing or emptying out of the bay towards the Golden Gate or flooding, filling up the bay, heading to Oakland. So that should be easy to remember. Ebbing is emptying, flooding is filling up. Generally, the ebb is stronger than the flood because it's going in the same direction as all the tributaries uh, flowing into the bay and out to the ocean. The flood generally is weaker because it's coming in and fighting against all the tributaries flowing out of the bay. The second fundamental you need to understand is both the ebb and the flood can be stronger than what you are physically capable of swimming against. You literally can be swimming one direction against the current while being pushed back in the opposite direction. And currents are measured in knots, so one knot equal 1.15 miles. Ebb currents occasionally, occasionally are up to six knots, or almost seven miles an hour, and rarely less than two knots. Flood currents are occasionally up to four knots, but rarely less than one. The variance in speed is due primarily to the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, though other factors such as high and low pressure systems, rain runoff, and uh, snow melt can also play a part. The full ebb flood cycle lasts approximately 12 and a half hours, with the ebb portion lasting seven to eight hours, and the flood lasting a much shorter four to five hours. And the water level can vary as much as eight feet. So within the space of seven to eight hours, all the water from San Pablo Bay, North Bay, and the San Francisco Bay is pouring out that tiny one mile entrance to the Golden Gate. It's like pulling the plug on a bathtub. The real takeaway is we're swimming in a river and that's why it's so crucial to have a fundamental understanding of how the currents work. Okay, on to the tide books. Here are the two types. One is visually depicted and the second is more data oriented. Here we have the sinusoidal tide table or the visual display of data. It shows the exact height and time for the high tides and the low tides and the exact speed in knots uh, for the max flood or ebb. This bottom line of data is uh, data for the Carquina Strait and isn't relevant to swimming in and around Aquatic Cove. The black peaks and valleys are not the maximum current or slack times. They're depictions of the high and low tides, but it can give you a good idea of how strong the current will be. Notice how steeply this high tide drops down to a low tide. Wait, 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 you're saying. What is max? What is slack? What do these terms mean? Well, it's relatively straightforward. Max means when the current is moving at its fastest, and slack is when the current has died out and is about to reverse itself. However, the current just doesn't stop on a dime and then reverse itself. It starts out gradually and builds up to what we call max, or the maximum velocity, and then it starts petering out until it reaches slack. Then the opposite current cuts in. Let's take a look at the second type of tide book, the data-driven one. This is the tabular tide book, and it shows the precise time for high tide, low tide, slack, and the precise time for slack, max, and uh, ebb and flood. Okay, so this is where the eyes start getting glazed over. 
What in the world do all these numbers mean? Well, let's start off on the left page here. And that's where we have the data for the height of the tide. And a quick exercise for you. At what time on Wednesday, December 1st, is high tide, is the morning high tide? And the correct answer is 7.26 a.m. But an important note, these data are for the Golden Gate Bridge. At Aquatic Cove, high and low tides are approximately 15 minutes later. So if high tide in the tide book is 726 and high tide at Aquatic Cove is 15 minutes later, when will it be high tide at Aquatic Cove? And if you answered 741, that's correct. So 726 plus 15 is 741. Let, second, let me decipher what this bolded 6.3 number is after the uh, high tide. That number lists how high the tide will be above the average height of low tide, which is always 0, 0.0. So with the bolded 6.3, that simply means the high tide will be 6.3 feet above the average low tide. So let's take a look at Sunday, December 5th. Note the bolded negative 1.4. This means the low tide will be 1.4 feet lower than the average low tide. And remember, I just mentioned a minute ago that the water level can drop more than eight feet. Well, if you look at the earlier in the day 6.8 and add that to the bolded negative 1.4, you can see the water level is going to drop 8.2 feet. As you're about to find out in a moment, this will result in a ripping ebb current. Again, remember though, high and low tide is useful primarily if you want to determine whether there's enough water to go through Farnsworth Gap or jump off a pier. Up here. Okay, currents. Let's move on to the currents. On the right hand side of the page um, are the data for the currents. It shows slack, max ebb, and max flood in knots. And remember, a knot equal 1.15 miles per hour. Just as I mentioned earlier, that the current starts at slack and builds to max and then dies back down, the current also doesn't reverse in one solid line across the bay. It starts reversing along the shore and then spreads out to the middle of the bay. So you can have the ebb starting to go west to the Golden Gate Bridge along our breakwater in Fort Mason, while out at Alcatraz, it's still flooding or heading east. Note, again, these data are for the Golden Gate. For our purposes, the very general rule of thumb is that slack is roughly one hour earlier at the opening than listed in the tide book. So for Wednesday, December 1st, the tide book says slack is going to be at 9.02 a.m. So what time will it be slack at the opening? One hour earlier would be 8.02 a.m. Knowing what time slack and the reverse current is due to arrive is extremely important to know if you're swimming outside the cove to Fort Mason or up the breakwater. If there's a strong ebb coming, you don't want to swim to Fort Mason, nor do you want to swim up the outside of the breakwater if there's a strong flood coming. Understanding and consulting the tide books is the first step in make, making sure you have a safe swim. Once you know what is predicted to happen, you now need to shift to determine what is actually happening. Once you're in the water, it does you little good to argue that the water isn't doing what the tide book said it was supposed to do. Remember, Mother Ocean doesn't know how to read a tide book and sometimes has a mind of her own. Particularly in the cove, the current may be flooding during an ebb, ebbing during a flood, and combinations of all. Without going into the cause of these anomalies, here are some tools for maintaining awareness throughout your swim. To determine what the water is actually doing, use the information available to you by observations out on the water. For example, the first method you can use is to check the orientation of the various boats moored in the cove. These boats are moored at the bow, that's the front of the boat, allowing them to swing north, east, south, west, based on the current at the boat. And the bow normally points into the current. So if you look out the window of the day room and see the boats pointing west, then you can assume it's flooding. But sometimes if the wind is exceptionally strong, as it is in the afternoons, the boats will swing about to face the wind regardless of what the current is doing. Once you enter the water, always check the current at the end of the cirque dock before heading out on your planned swim. 
Stop and check again at any buoy or boat you pass to verify current direction and speed. It's critical to perform these observations when you're swimming with the current. If you're swimming out to the opening, cutting across the current, here's a way to confirm the current's direction. If your view through the opening and out into the bay is getting smaller, then it's flooding as the water pushes you east towards Hyde Street Pier. Conversely, if your view through the opening and out into the bay is getting wider, then it's ebbing as the current pushes you west towards Van Ness Street. Even though you've determined what the current is actually doing, you can still get into trouble by heading west while it's ebbing, or east while it's flooding, finding the current much too strong to swim against back to the club. So what do you do if this happens? Well, if you're swimming along the outside of Muni Pier, uh, against the current and it's stronger than you expected, tuck underneath the pier since the pilings greatly reduce the velocity of the current. If you're swimming along the breakwater against the current, the closer you swim to the struts, the weaker the current since those struts slow down the flow of water. And don't forget, the current is always weaker on the inside of the breakwater than on the outside. The common sense rule of thumb is to swim against the current on your way out and then ride the current back on your way to the opening. In the winter, the water also can be flowing out of the opening, heading towards Alcatraz, and if you're not aware of that condition, you may find yourself too far out into the boating lanes, not to mention you now have a challenging swim to get back into the cove. Open water swimming has inherent dangers that aren't present in a pool. For that reason, it's important not only to be aware of the water currents and conditions, but also to be aware of rowing traffic, other swimming, swimmers, and floating debris. To be aware of these potential op uh, obstacles, get your head out of the water frequently and look around. Over the past five years, the, both the Dolphin Club and the South End have doubled memberships, making it critical we maintain awareness during each of our swims. Well, there you have it. I hope I've demystified the tide books and given you some safe and practical knowledge to use when swimming in and about Aquatic Cove. Thanks to both Joe Boone and Jeff Gunderson for their invaluable contributions to this presentation, and thanks to you for joining me today. Okay.